Okay, we'll uh, talk about a touchy subject in our area, and uh, usually who deal with uh, testosterone replacement, who take care of men, you have to drag the information out of them, especially if the provider is the lady doctor. So we'll try to talk about the subject from practical point of view, like what you do in the clinic, what shall you do, how simple can you approach such a case, and always remember, insurance are on your neck. So you have to order the specific test, especially the treatment is usually not covered. Now, for, uh, for our uh, okay. outline, we'll talk about a little bit of definition, introduction to the mechanism of action, clinical benefits of testosterone in hypogonadal males. So we are not talking about use of testosterone outside that field. Symptoms of testosterone deficiency, how do we diagnose in a clinic, not in an institution or a university? Who are the candidates for replacements as their guidelines? What are the types of testosterone we can offer to our patient? And how can we monitor the adverse effects? Okay. Now, hypogonadism. Hypogonadism have different definitions, but most of the agreed upon definitions in hypogonadism in a male refers to a decrease in either sperm production or testosterone production or both. And as we know, there are primary hypogonadism and secondary hypogonadism. So we have to differentiate between both of them. It will be helpful for our management and treatment. For the introduction, now, testosterone. Everybody knows testosterone. Testosterone is the male hormone. Now, testosterone works as three hormones. Number one, it directly binds by itself to the androgen receptor or in tissues like the external genitalia, in the prostate, and in the sexual hair, can be converted by the 5-alpha reductase to dihydrotestosterone which binds to the androgen receptor. Also, it can act as estrogen, as our pediatric endocrinologists deal with these cases in kids with short stature. Acts as estrogen following conversion by aromatase to estradiol and binds to the estrogen receptor, mainly in the bone and in the body fat. Now, what are the clinical benefits in general of testosterone in hypogonadal men? I just put a slide which you find on social media. So, signs of low testosterone, if you search on social media, that's what you find. That people with low testosterone usually have constant fatigue, enlarged prostate, loss of muscle tone, increased risk of ED, increased fat, heart disease, and gynecomastia. This is if you put a search on your Google, this is what the patient looks at. So he comes to you to the clinic and he wants to reverse the look of his body. That's what's usually concerning. Now, the clinical benefits of giving testosterone, uh, what's the purpose of it, is for virilization and sexual function. So if you have low testosterone, the patient usually complains from a decrease in lipido and the level of energy. Now, if you give them testosterone, that will improve. The other thing is the muscle strength and fat-free mass. It also will improve. One of the major studies have shown that there will be 22% improvement in bench press, 45% in squats, fat-free mass by 5%. That's why a lot of people in the gym like to use testosterone because it enhances their muscle performance and muscle mass. 
and that was proven by a study which was done for 10 weeks in hypogonadal males with 100 milligram of testosterone injections. Now, what about bone density? It will increase. 72 patients with hypogonadism received testosterone replacement. 39% of them showed an increase in bone density in one year, then reached the normal range after that, and it was maintained as long as they were kept on the testosterone. Does it affect your mood or cognition? There is, in the literature, inconsistent data about that. Some data says there is improvement in the mood, some did not. And there is no effect on cognition. So this is the expected clinical benefits when we give patients who have hypogonadism. Do we reverse the picture? Do we give them this look? Okay and they will be more confident, they will be happy, they will increase muscle mass. Of course, they will not be like that. This is only when you go to the gym, okay? So don't expect your patients in the clinic to have this look. Now, in general, What are the symptoms of testosterone deficiency in various ages? Now, in adolescent and young adults who with uh, pediatricians deal with those patients when they come to the clinic who have testosterone deficiency, they may not have full puberty or a delay in the puberty. And usually they look younger than their chronological age. They might present with a small genitalia lack of beard formation, failure of voice to deepen, and poor muscle mass gain. Those signs should alert the pediatrician or the GP in a 15 or 16 year old boy that there may be something. Should we investigate? Should we refer to the endocrinologist? Should we do basic labs? In adults, usually the symptoms are a little bit different and we have to drag the answers for our patients, especially who deal with diabetic patients in their 50s and 60s. You have to ask questions and sometimes they will not answer to you, except after they trust you. Is there a decrease in the lipido, in the muscle strength, in the vigor, in the depressed mood? Are they depressed? Have they been depressed recently? These questions could be done by any other medical problem like thyroid, like vitamin deficiencies, like actual anxiety. So they are not really very specific for testosterone deficiency. What about the muscle mass? The person can tell you, I'm not able to put muscles. I go to the gym. I do a lot of exercises, but I'm not having muscle mass. That could be a sign of testosterone deficiency. And sometimes uh, they start to happen problem in their body hair, they start to lose some of their body hair, especially on locations like the legs and the thighs. Hot flushes, especially that can happen if they are severely deficient in testosterone. Of course, gynecomastia, you know, the correlation between the testosterone and the estrogen, and of course, infertility. So most of these symptoms, you have to ask patients about them and look for them to help you if this patient might have testosterone deficiency. Now, when you examine the patient, what things you should look for? Check for normal virilization and the genitalia. If the problem happened before puberty and the patient is not treated, most likely they don't have body hair and they don't have beard line like their family members. There is no temporal hair recession and their full muscular muscle musculature is not really formed very well and their voice is not deep. This is if the problem happened before puberty and they were not treated. And their testis will be small and their phallus size will be also small. They are also unicoid proportions as the endocrinologists know that can give you a clue that this problem happened before puberty. 
In adults, usually if it happens, you don't find signs unless it's a very aggressive and late case. How do you diagnose? Who should you screen? Which society you should follow? Should you screen everybody? Now, as per the endocrine society guidelines, there are risk groups. Any patient with disease of the cellular region, any patient that is taking a medication that might affect testosterone production, like high-dose steroids, opioids, HIV-associated weight loss, and renal failure patient, and severe to moderate COPD, and men who suffer from infertility, osteoporosis, low trauma, and in diabetic patients. So diabetic patients are being recommended to be screened for testosterone. What's the best screening test? What shall we start with? Always remember, you are being seeing a patient in your office. And you always remember, you need to ask for the test, which will help you the most and less expensive. So all the societies have recommended to start with total testosterone, morning, fasting, not one time. You have to repeat it two to three times. Don't depend on one different assays are different. So if it's low or if it's normal. And if you repeat it again in your clinic and it still is low, okay, then repeat again with the LH and the FSH. So they can help you to look for pituitary causes or to look for the testicular causes. So if you have low t uh, testosterone, normal LH, FSH, or you have low testosterone low, and FSH and LH are elevated. So start with the total testosterone. Okay. After the total testosterone, with doing the LH and FSH, if you are suspecting secondary hypogonadism, then you do your other hormones from the pituitary gland. And also remember to measure the ferritin, the transferrin, because hemiocidrosis is one of the hidden causes. And then proceed with MRI. You have to look for the pituitary and the hypothalamic area. So don't order the MRI unless you are convinced it's a secondary. What about if it's primary? Well, if it's primary as in confirmed, you can go ahead and order the karyotype if you want to. Does it help? It might. It might not. Of course, karyotyping genetic testing is very expensive to be done. It might be important if the patient is seeking fertility to know this information. And then always remember, this is always a board question, why testosterone usually is not the accurate in certain cases. As mentioned before in the previous talks, you might have increased in the sex hormone binding globulins in cases of aging, in cases of hyperthyroidism, high estrogen concentration, liver disease, HIV, anti-seizure medications. So the total testosterone is not really accurate. What about decrease in the sex hormone binding globulins, which we face on daily basis because we see a lot of obese patients with insulin resistance. So they have low sex hormone binding globulins and total testosterone is different from their free testosterone. So that's where you should order the androgen index and the free testosterone if you suspect such patients to help you out, which we do primarily to start with. We order them at the same time, unless the insurance, of course, don't accept. Now, well, who are the candidates for replacement? Do we give testosterone to everybody who comes to your clinic? Follow the guidelines. There are guidelines to help you. From the endocrine society guidelines, you should individualize the case. Give it to older men who have symptoms and conditions suggestive of testosterone deficiency. And they have consistently low testosterone level. Like if they have symptoms, but they don't have low testosterone level, don't give to them. If they have low testosterone level and they have no symptoms or sign, don't give to them. We need both to be at the same time because we need the benefit of the patient and the safety of the patient. And then if you have this proved, especially in multiple testing, 
before you give, you have to do primary basic tests. You have to check the prostate. Okay? We expect in older men, especially in uh, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, to have problems with their prostate. So check the PSA before you start the treatment in such a case. And also the hematocrit level. And you have to monitor the PSA and the testosterone and the hematocrit during treatment. So just not check PSA and just leave it as it is. Now, the trials which were used to confirm these ideas, the famous T trials, the testosterone trials. Now, it was a seven placebo controlled trial. It was one year for one year and it, they wanted to measure the efficacy on testosterone on sexual function, physical function, vitality, cognitive function, anemia, bone density, and cardiovascular risk factors for older men who are symptomatic and have consistently low testosterone. So they included men above the age of 65 with low testosterone on two occasions and have symptoms or signs or both suggestive of testosterone deficiency. And there were 51,000 screened. Out of those who met the criteria were only 790 subjects. And they were treated with, for one year in the active arm with testosterone gel. And that pre-treatment testosterone was 232 nanograms. After one year, the average was 500. How did they recruit the patients? They just did telephone screening. They called the patients and they asked questions. Do you have problem in walking, climbing stairs? Do you have low sexual desire? And then these are the qualifying symptoms. If you had a history of prostate cancer before, or cancer of any kind in the last three months, or you had an MI in the last three months or stroke, and you are really obese above 37, they were excluded from the study. And then they went to the first visit, and then screening visit, and then they measured the testosterone, and finally, they only elected 789 patients out of this group. And they were, they consented for randomization and participation. Okay, what did they find out? Roughly, in the sexual function, there was only moderate improvement in the sexual function activity, desire, and it was very mild in the erectile function. In the physical activity function, it was not significant. In the vitality, they were having a better mood and lower severity of depressive symptoms. And by the scale of vitality, as the next slide will show, there was no difference. So, if you notice in the first slide, the, the p-value was only significant in the sexual activity part of it. The others, they had insignificant p-value. What about the cognitive function? 493 subgroups, a subgroup who met the criteria, they were uh, associ with associated memory impairment. They were followed for six and 12 months after that, and there was no difference in that regard. What about coronary artery? 170 patients were included to go in that arm. After one year, there was an increase in the non-calcified coronary artery plaque formation by using the score CCTA. This caused some concerns for the investigators and always remember that 50% of those had already severe atherosclerosis at the baseline. So they were not like normal, okay? Anemia, 788 patients 126 had anemia at the baseline. There was an increase in one gram after treating the treatment for one year. So it did improve a little bit on their anemia. What about the bone density? 211 patients underwent the bone density using the quantitative CT scan at the baseline and 20 months later. 
there was significant improvement in both central and peripheral bone improvement, but not as significant as we expect in using the bisphosphonate. So, if you look, you can find those in the New England Journal. They are there. And, of course, there is the other study which was stopped early on in the 75-year-old because of the increase in the risk of cardiovascular. But they are being reviewed in the literature. The other one, which is called the effect of testosterone treatment in all done men, it was stopped earlier because of the cardiovascular. Now, before we go to talk about the adverse events, what types of testosterone do we use and what we have? Different countries have different kinds. Some of you will not, will, this will be first time to hear about some of those. Everybody, I think, knows about the testosterone gel and the injections. Okay, this is the usual common we use. They are the topical transdermal delivery. We have the androgel, we have the testem, the fortesta, and the exiron, different kind of gels. Some are given directly to the skin, okay, and some of them are by applicators, and some of them the doses are different. So these are all considered a topical transdermal delivery. I'm not sure in Bahrain what do they have, if they have any of those. And some people have experience with those gels, some don't. And after the gel, of course, there is the, the patch. And it was the first one came in 1994 as a scrotal patch. And then, then came the androderm patch. It was worn on the arm and the torso. And, but it causes a lot of severe skin rashes. I'm not sure it's being used that often nowadays. And, of course, the injections. Uh, in UAE, most of us use the injections, and we have three kinds of injections. And most of us, or most of the doctors, are using the third kind, which is the long-acting injection, or what is called Nipido. Of course, it's a 1,000 milligram. It's given every 12 weeks. And, of course, if you read the label and the literature, there is an increased risk of pulmonary oil Microembolism, always remember that. And of course, the, uh, the other injections which is being used every three weeks or four weeks or two weeks according to the injection. And of course, there is what we call the injectors, not common in this country, used in the US. And they are like a pen device that you can use on a weekly basis, the patients can use. We don't have enough information in the literature about this and used in the U.S. for transgender. Oral preparations. I'm not sure if uh, people like to use oral preparations. I, I think most of the endocrinologists don't advocate that because of the hepatic side effects, jaundice, hepatoma, and the others. Now, there is another form which bypasses the liver. The first pass hepatic liver is being approved, and but it's associated with increase in the blood pressure and cardiovascular events. But should be aware of it if there's a patient coming in your clinic mentioning this oral preparation. Others, of course, there are buccal tablets, subcutaneous, testosterone pellets, which we can done by the doctors. Also, there is nasal. So there are a lot of options. Most of us never heard about these actually before, but they are there. If patients come to your clinic, mentioning any of those, especially coming from U.S. or Europe. Now, the last few slides, quickly before we finish. Who should not take testosterone? If you have a prostate cancer, history of prostate cancer, all of them except though, except one group who had a radical prostatectomy for a cancer which was confined to the prostate and has been free of the disease and had no detectable PSA for a minimum of two years. Otherwise, it should not be used. Breast cancer should not be used. Severe lower urinary tract symptoms, there's a scoring system if it's above 19, don't use testosterone. 
If the patient has polycythemia, hematocrit above 50, he has severe sleep apnea, uncontrolled heart failure, just don't use the drug. Now, check the level of the testosterone after you start, two to three months after the treatment and also after you change the dose. And always check LH in patients with primary hypogonadism to see if it's normalizing. Do the bone density every two years if there is osteoporosis. So always you need to keep monitoring your patient. Just not give the medication and tell him go get back to me after a year or two. And always also check the PSA after you give the treatment. Three months and six months and 12 months. If there is an increase in the PSA from the baseline by more than 1.4 or you, you, you palpated a nodule, refer to the urologist. So there is criteria for you when to refer to the urologist in such cases because there is a risk of prostate cancer. What about benign prostate hyperplasia? Meta-analysis done in 2018 showed there is no effect on the LUTs when compared to placebo in 1,771 hypogonadal patients, also on the T-trials. Erythrocytosis is very common, especially with injections. One of the meta-analysis, 1,543 patients, and there was an increase. And stop if the hematocrit increases more than 54%. Resume after it improves. Always remember that there could be other causes for polycythemia, like hypoxia, sleep apnea, and perform phlebotomy. This is part of it, how to treat such erythrocytosis. Venous thromboembolism, which can be due to the erythrocytosis, always is a very rare complication, but we have to mention it. And cardiovascular risk, it's, it's a very confusing and very long thing, discussion. We're just going to touch about the safety, that's it. I'm not going to go through the details of it. The Indo Society and the FDA issued statements to alert the clinicians to the potential concern about testosterone and cardiovascular safety. And they had the conclusion, there is a possibility of increased cardiovascular risk associated with testosterone use. If you look in the literature, there are studies which show yes, there are studies which show no. So individualize your patient and try to elect the right patient to use testosterone for. And that will be the last slide. So we finish for time. Uh, okay. Any questions?